it's like early. Fuck you. You're be jealous. You're welcome. Yeah, if I cared. That a girl. Uh, hey, it's early. You guys didn't drink enough last night, apparently. Here's Rachel. <laughs> Thank you for that amazingly heartfelt, wonderful introduction, Chris. I can feel how much you love me in your soul. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> um, welcome everyone, because I know you guys are all excited to hear me talk about unicorns for an hour at an InfoSec conference. That's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> for all of you guys thinking like, oh, this really isn't for me. It is. You all need to hear this. And it's going to be hard, much like Amanda yesterday was hard, because our industry is broken. It's broken in so many ways. It's broken because of mental illness, because there's no path in InfoSec, because even people that have been here for 30 years still feel the struggle. And we're going to talk about the things that you can do to change that this morning. That's me. They made me take a professional photo, because apparently the one that we were using on the website with me with the, like the bear filter where no one can see my face just doesn't fly with uh, legal in HR. Um, my last name is spelled, pronounced Jacobazzi. Don't worry, that's why it's just Rachel G on everything. No one really knows. I'm a manager over at Target. I manage the penetration testing team currently. I have kind of a wild background. We'll go through that in like five slides. Uh, I have 16 years of experience, seven of that's in InfoSec, the other seven, eight, nine, the other nine, because I can math it this early in the morning, are in a variety of weird things, but that's what you get when you get into InfoSec, you get a crazy background. My Twitter handle really is Soul Crusher. 86 is not the year I was born, that's my level. Um, so I'm a level 86 Soul Crusher. Uh, I would tell you guys the story, but I love it so much more when other people tell it because they embellish it. Oh, it's perfect. May, <laughs> it may or may not involve making somebody cry in the middle of training with their gym selfies. It's amazing. Find somebody, they'll tell it to you. All right. Yeah, Molly. Molly will tell it to you. It's amazing. Okay. So let's talk about why unicorns. So aside from because I wanted to talk about unicorns for an hour, uh, the InfoSec community has this really nice, unique way of degrading the word unicorn. How many people here know what a unicorn is in reference to hiring? Ooh, everybody that actually hires people. So a few years ago, this, thing, this shift happened in InfoSec where the job description started including more and more and more experiences to the point where people would look at a job description and be like, I, I can't fill every shoe in this job description. No one could. But then we handed them to recruiters and recruiters were like, you got to check every single box or you're not getting a call back. So it became known as being a unicorn. Companies reaching out looking for a unicorn. But as someone that hires and someone that writes those descriptions, there's so many things because we know that there are so many paths and ways into InfoSec. Your background can include 20 different things. And I'm just looking for some combination of that that shows me that you really want to have that job. So instead of being a unicorn and looking at that as being bad, everybody here is a unicorn. We all have a unique background, a unique set of skills. And we're going to talk about how you can take that, embrace it, and actually be happy with a 20-year career path here. Actually figure it out. But there are roadblocks. So that's what we're going to talk about. What are the roadblocks? Why do we know that it's a broken system? What can you personally as an individual do to make it easier on yourself. And if you manage anybody, if you're in charge in any capacity, there are things you can be doing better too. We don't want to hear it, but it's true. And I'm just here to provide the message. So let's talk about the roadblocks, right? The best one is, how do I get to where you are? I stand up on stage and I tell people about the weird things that I find in my job and somehow they listen to me. And at the end, I always get the question, that sounds really cool, how to get to where you are. But it's a hard question to answer. 
there isn't a roadmap. And everyone's used this slide, and I know some of you have used it because I stole it from presentations online. Uh, and this slide is that uh, the path I took to get to where I am should look like a straight line, and instead it looks like a messy line. And uh, that's great, but it doesn't really describe anything. So this is legitimately my job titles for the last 16 years. Right, you guys can see the connection. Not tenuous lines, it's very straight, right? If I gave you this roadmap, you'd be able to get here. You'd get right where I am. It's not like the description of my job works any better. You know, like, how does someone that's a linguist become a penetration testing manager? There's some weird stuff in there. Social media monitoring, facilitator, signals analyst, phishing analyst. I did IR detection at Intel at once one time. It's not like I can give you my life story or my resume and you're going to be able to get to where I was. In fact, the amount of choices, the amount of twists and turns and leaps of faith and opportunities that got me here, you would choose differently. And that's okay. But you can still get to my place. Your path would be different. And it's not about how you get there. It's about you getting there. But that path doesn't have to hurt. It doesn't have to be hard. We don't have to make it hard on each other. Job hopping is real in our industry. Everyone knows if you want to get make it an infosec, if you want to switch what you're doing, you got a two to four year lifespan at your current company. But why? Why are we accepting this? I shouldn't have to change my company because I want to go from Intel to pen testing. Because I want to go from IR to red team. Heck, because I just want to move up one level. Why should I have to completely switch my company? I was told, like, years ago, when I was at a very nice company, I'd been there five years, I was like, you know, I think I'm ready to move into management. I did management in the military. I really like this company. I believe in it. I want to be the next wave that helps people. And I was told, oh, that's cute. Go somewhere else for a few years and come back. Go somewhere else. If I leave this door, you're not getting me back. And I've run into the same people later on. Oh my God, you did amazing things. You ready to come back? Pfft. No, you didn't believe in me five years ago. Are you going to believe in me in another five years? What about a year from now? And I bring you this weird, crazy idea. Are you going to believe in me then? No. Why do we accept this as just the normal in this community? But then we have the other realm of it, right? Who in here has been doing it for 20 plus years? Out of those people that have been doing it, how many of you have been doing the same thing, same job area, same whatever? Right? Because you know, right? This is the curse of the experts. I don't need to be in management. I'm going to be an individual contributor. And it's great. You are. But then you do it for five, maybe 10 years, and you get stuck. Now you're regulated to a legacy system. Oh, we can't move you. You're the only person that understands this technology because the company changed around you. But you can see that path ends. It ends for you. Everyone can see that. And you try so hard. And yes, you have a long career. And yes, you're an expert in that technology. And you probably are amazing at your job. But the rest of your company isn't going to lift you up. They're not going to change for you. So now we have this weird amalgamation where either you have to change every couple of years or you get stuck. But there are things that you can do better. So what can you do, right? Because I'm not just going to sit up here and be like, everything's broken. Good luck. <laughs> Oh my God, I hate those talks. I'm like, you're right, everything's broken. I don't like it either. Let's revolt. And then they're like, okay, thanks for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. And I'm like, cool, when's, when's, when are we going to revolt? When are we going to change? He's like, oh, no, that's someone else's talk. I'm like, no. So what can you do, right? Opportunities. What we teach people in college, 
from the very beginning. What we tell people when they ask us, we tell them, oh, opportunity is like 70% your tech skills and 30% luck. Like, just get those tech skills up and those opportunities will come. But that's not how the world works. That's not how jobs work. That's not how any industry works. And it's definitely not how ours works. But we lie to each other. We say, you don't need to have soft skills. You don't need to know how to network. Just get your tech skills up. Become an expert at that system. Then your opportunities will fall into place. That's not how the world works. It's actually equal parts. And we're really, really great at that right half. We're really great at assuming our luck will come and our tech skills will be good enough. But man, are we bad at the people that we know or at our soft skills. It's not our fault. Everyone's heard the joke, right? Getting into tech, you won't have to talk to people. Oh, you're introverted? Oh, it's cool, just get into tech. You won't ever have to meet anyone new or give talks or communicate. Technology is full of some of the biggest communicators. <laughs> but we don't teach it. And those of us that are good at it, the ones that you've watched for the last day, the ones you're gonna watch today, the ones that got the courage to stand up on stage and tell you the amazing things that they know, those people weren't taught how to do that. They struggled. They struggled with anxiety. You can't see it. I'm literally shaking up here on this stage. You can't hear it in my voice. You might be able to see my sweat soon, but <laughs> you can't tell that this gives me anxiety because I was taught. And I took those opportunities, but I didn't come from tech industry. I came from a different industry. I'm so proud to have served in the military, but one of the best parts about what I did in the military was that they forced me to stand in front of people that they were like, oh, they're like seven ranks above you, and if you even mumble an um, they're gonna be so mad at you. Like, not the best way to learn how to give a speech in front of people, but definitely training that I've used along the way. The opportunity here. I didn't apply to be a keynote. This was an opportunity back in May. For those of you that don't know, Egg Drop and Pink Nightmare who run this, Chris and Jamie, I used to work with Chris and he moved. But in May, I was in the state that you moved to, visiting my in-laws, and I was like, hey, I haven't seen you guys in months. Can we go out and have dinner? So we're out at dinner, and I was like, oh, I think I'm gonna apply to give a talk at Gurkhan this year. Chris is wonderful. He's always like, whatever you want, Rachel. And I'm like, one day, I'm just gonna sit up here in a chair and tell stories that have nothing to do with InfoSec, and you're gonna let me, and it's crazy. But we're out at dinner, and they just announced Amanda Berlin, InfoSister, as key one, or day one keynote. And I was like, oh man, she's a great speaker. This is gonna be great. And he mumbled something about day two keynote, and I was like, oh, you guys chose? Who is it? And he's like, no, idiot, do you want day two keynotes? I was like, ugh, I, I guess you answer yes when someone asks you that. Uh, and then before I could change my mind, he tweeted it. <laughs> Which is lovely, and how I know some of you are following my Twitter now. I'm sorry, the only thing on there is like, swag from conferences and discussions of me being a basic white girl with some pumpkin spice lattes and Ugg boots. But go right ahead. Follow it if you must. But we gotta get better at communicating. So maybe you don't give up and give presentations. But can you tell someone what your job is? Do you have the skill set to speak about the technical things that you do at any level? It's a unique skill to take a very technical concept and break it down into under two minutes and be able to tell somebody that has never seen it before, never heard of it, what you do. Do you use Twitter? I mean, our community thrives on Twitter. Even Dave said it, that's where we get the best intel from. If you want to send your communication out on Twitter, are you confident in what you're sending? How about emails? What company doesn't use emails? Is there literally anybody in here that doesn't send an email on behalf of their job? Yeah, exactly. 
Email is a form of communication. And yet we don't teach people when they start out how to properly communicate. And I'm sure people have had that issue where you're a manager or you run a team and something comes back across your desk, you read through the email chain, and you're like, oh my God, why would they say it this way? Like I deal with pen testers who give findings to teams that don't understand what a vulnerability is or a pen test or a finding and have to give remediation. And I'll read through and I'll be like, oh, you should have stopped emailing like 17 emails ago and just got on a call. They obviously have no idea what you're talking about. But not one of the 20 people on my team were taught how to properly convey the ideas in written format. So how am I to get mad at somebody that was never taught? Why don't we take the time to do this? Is it because we know we can do it? But just because I can do it doesn't mean you can do it. Soft skills training is a real thing. So your company doesn't pay for it. Cool, YouTube's a thing. You can Google it, there are free books, presentations. I mean, Adrian and his team give these presentations out for free online. Just go study them. See the mannerisms of the people that captured your, your thought process, the people that rendered you speechless for an hour. How did they talk? How did they engage their audience? These are easy things that you can do, but no one tells anybody. Not too long ago, I worked at a career demo on a booth that was for, I don't know, conferences or something like that. And I just tweeted out, I'm not followed by that many people. I don't know that many people, but I was like, hey, if you give presentations, what would you give as advice? And that thread was like 700 responses long. Everyone wants to help. Why isn't everyone helping right away? You know, I, I think my background is unique because some of the skills that I have came from weird places, right? I'm really good at social engineering. I can convince people of all sorts of things, but I didn't learn it in InfoSec, right? I went through survival training in the military. And part of survival training is like, can you talk somebody out of killing you? And I was like, well, let's try. And it's very intense. Uh, and more than once, I was like, oh man, they're just gonna, they're gonna kill me tomorrow. I just run my mouth too much. It'll be fine. Uh, but like, once I convince somebody as a hostage, like, you don't need to kill me, convincing somebody to give me a job becomes immensely easier. <laughs> right? So people are always like, oh, your skills are so good. I was like, yeah, but you don't want to learn the way I did. I mean, don't get me wrong. Very grateful for the survival training I had, but I would not recommend that to anybody. It's horrible. So invest in yourself, invest in that training for yourself, right? And once you get better at communicating, you can get better at networking. Ooh, but networking, that's where we get into the scary part, right? I can send an email, I can send a tweet, but you want me to meet a human face to face? Ooh, no thank you. And that's because in our mind, like if you close your mind right now and you imagine networking, you're imagining the same scene that everyone is, right? Big round tables, everyone in suits, you turning to the person beside you, giving them your business card, shaking their hand, maybe telling each other your jobs, no actual content. Let's try it. I want everyone to meet the person in front of or beside them. Oh, I'm not joking, go right ahead. I will wait. <laughs> talk over you. <laughs> but do you realize that awkwardness, that first initial like two seconds where you're like, oh shit, is she really going to make me meet somebody? That never goes away. 
I'm gonna tell you right now, I am an enthusiastic person, naturally bubbly. I enjoy meeting new people and it still sucks to network. It sucks to know that I have to constantly meet new people if I want to advance my career. It's not that it gets less awkward. You just find new coping mechanisms. And the best part is we're in InfoSec, which means we have a non-traditional way of networking. Right? You're, you're here at a conference. There's opportunities. All of you guys sat next to someone you didn't know. But until I made that joke, you didn't meet them. I know some of you guys had been in here for at least 15 minutes before this talk started and you were on your phones and not saying anything to the person sitting next to you. That's a lost opportunity. I was recently at DerbyCon and the weird part about DerbyCon is that there's all these lines that you never know what they go to. But uh, I learned a long time ago that if you see a line, you just stand in it. It's probably gonna be something good at the end, right? All right, so just standing in line, minding my own business, eventually got like a root beer float and a fake badge, it was cool. But behind me in line, there was this guy. It's like, oh, it's my first derby kind. I was like, cool, mine too, first and last, woohoo! <laughs> I was like, sure, wh what do you do? And he's like, well, I really wanna get into IR. It's like, oh, okay, cool, well, what have you done so far? He's like, I don't know where to start. Just so happens my friend Casey, who also sucks at networking, was in line with me. I was like, oh, have you met Casey? Casey's been working at IR at my company for three years. They got to talk in, they exchanged information, he gave them some example books. I have so many stories like that. For the closing ceremonies at DerbyCon, there's a really long line to get in. But there's also these weird breaks where, you know, fire hazards, so people have to not stand in front of the door. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not standing in the back of the line. So I just kept walking like I knew where I was going. And I got to the last, part, so the very first part of the line with the door, there happened to be like this much space at the end of that line. I walked up to a group of guys there, six of them, and I was just like, hi, do you know if like these are separate lines, you're going to open all the door? And he's like, no, nah, that guy, the big scary one with the scary shirt, he said that they're all one line. I was like, cool, cool. Hi, I'm Rachel. I met all of them. I was like, cool, now that we're friends, I'm staying here. I was like, we're friends. And it was a joke, and like, I understand that it makes me a bad person for cutting in line, but like, get better at your social engineering. Um, and I got to talking to them, and just like, to pass the time, I'm like, cool, what do you guys do? Ooh, turns out, they are new to pen testing. Ooh, huzzah, because I am a manager who needs to hire pen testers. And while like, some of them had jobs, because you know, we have a deficit, and a shortage, a couple of them didn't. And I'm actually interviewing the, one of them next week. They didn't know. They didn't know me. They didn't know that this opportunity was walking up to them. Neither did I. And I understand that this isn't everybody's comfort zone. You're not just gonna meet a stranger at a conference. But if you take just one, one little leap of faith, you might actually meet someone pretty cool. And it just starts by saying hi. So, hi everybody, I'm Rachel. Yes, AA meetings are a thing. I, uh, I'm an infosec, but I haven't always been, and I like to give talks, and if anyone wants to come talk to me afterwards, I'm not gonna say no, but if you see me talking to two other people and you stand in line, that's weird, just come find me when no one else is around me, because I guarantee I'm not gonna have people talking to me all day, and even if I did, I would still have time for you. That's an opportunity that you all just had. <laughs> I maybe promised this specific unicorn one to a little girl that came today. But I'm still wearing crazy makeup and I'm a big woman and I know that I stand out in a crowd. I'm also loud. You will hear me laughing because when I laugh at dumb dad jokes, I really laugh at them. It'll be easy. Plus, you all have my Twitter handle. You reach out on Twitter. Right? And that's how you start. You find your community. So InfoSec started maybe 30, 40 years ago. There are amazing books about the start. Right? Cliff Soul wrote a book called The Cuckoo's Egg about the very first instant response case. For anyone that hasn't read it, it was... He was working at UC Berkeley, 
happen to have to track down this weird like time management accounting issue, end up chasing a threat actor all the way to Russia. It's a true story, and it's about technology, but it reads like a spy novel. It's amazing, right? It's in the 70s. For those that haven't seen it, there's a new novel out called Cult of the Dead Cow about one of the first vulnerability disclosures ever that ever happened. Because before then, no one took them seriously. But they realized that this was an important part of our industry. And they fought for it. And that was 20 years ago. Back then, InfoSec was a hobby. It wasn't even thought of as a job. It was just something they did in their spare time to to, you know, see how things work. And eventually it became a community. You got two, three, four, five, 15 of these people together. And they started sharing ideas. And they realized that the same issues existed. And now we're an industry. But we still refer to it as a community. It's still set up that way. There are thousands of positions in InfoSec. The likelihood that straight out of college, your very first position is going to be in the part of the industry, in the part of the community that you're going to stay in for the rest of your life is pretty much non-existent. So you look at your hobbies, you find something that you kind of are interested in, and you find the community. They're out there. There's listservs. For anyone that doesn't know what listserv is, it's these like weird email chains where like half the time you're trolling each other because you all work at different companies and the other half the time you're actually getting stuff done. They're amazing. I highly recommend and every single vertical has one. You just have to ask around. They exist. It even gets very specific, right? I work for a retailer. I did information security and intel for a retailer. All the retailers got together. And don't let something like you work at a different company stop you, right? Sharing your information only makes the entirety of the internet better. I mean, unless you're one of those black hat hackers and then I guess if you want to share information with me, that's fine. But if you end up arrested, like put me in your memoirs, I don't know, right? For those of you that don't really like Twitter, there's LinkedIn groups. There's meetups. I guarantee that someone's talking about InfoSec in your city. And of course, there's Twitter groups. But when I say say hi, I don't mean like slip into my DMs like it's 4 a.m. with a hey. I'm not going to answer that. Actually reach out to me. Hey, Rachel, I heard you talk. I'm kind of interested in doing presentations. Do you have any suggestions of things that I can start with? Cool. I will answer that. I don't know really a lot about pen testing, but it sounds kind of cool. Do you have any suggestions? Yep. Here's like six people to follow and some books to read. I put this in here because a while ago, Jason Street, who likes to give these talks, had a tweet about how every time he gave a talk, people just wrote hi in his Twitter DMs. And he was just like, I'm just going to start sending a gift back of me waving because what do I answer to that? And it's true. It's true. It's cool that you want to reach out. I have not met anybody, especially someone that stands up on stage, that doesn't want to help people or answer questions. But you have to be specific about what you're asking. I can't help you if I don't know what you're asking for. Right? So here's some suggestions. I'll wait if anyone wants to take pictures because y'all can just copy and paste. All right. So then we get to, you know how to network, you know how to communicate, let's talk about you, All right? So the elevator pitch started years ago with the editor at Vogue. I actually looked this up because I was, I thought it was weird. And also I wanted to tell a dumb story that had nothing to do with InfoSec. Much like this entire presentation. <laughs> so the Vogue editor was notorious for not listening to new pitches during any of the editing meetings. And so the only way that you can get him a new pitch idea was to trap him in an elevator for the 45 seconds it took to get from the ground floor to the Vogue offices in New York City. So all of his writers would get together and they would take turns, like taking the elevator ride and quickly explaining it. It morphed into this weird concept in business that if you can tell me about yourself in two minutes, then I'm going to give you a shot. And that's true, but that doesn't work for our community. Like, it's cool if you can tell me your background in two minutes, but if I told you all my jobs, does that tell you anything about what I do? 
It doesn't. Your job, our job titles in InfoSec are ridiculous. They're made up half the time. They never describe what you actually do. It's really hard to get that across. So you need to learn to champion yourself. Instead of thinking about it as like, I'm going to give you my elevator pitch. I'm going to tell you the top half of my resume. I'm going to talk really fast. You're going to really enjoy it. And then you're going to give me a job. Tell me something cool. Okay. So we're going to take another leap of faith. Does anyone here want to tell me something cool that they're doing? You have a minute. Come on, it's your shot. Everyone gets to hear something cool that you're doing. Go ahead. Okay, for those that didn't hear, his company helps make these giant domes that cars use. They're writing the scripts that track the cameras within. Does anybody think that that's kind of cool? Yeah, cool. Find him afterwards. Talk to him about this. I have a unicorn horn for the person that was brave enough to tell me about themselves. Give it to a little girl. Come on. Men can be unicorns too. So if you were on the people that were really, really, really upset I didn't have enough for the audience, that's the person you need to tackle to get it. All right? All right, so how do you learn to champion yourself, right? You need to learn to speak with passion. This is what attracts people together. You need to speak from an area of what you love to do. This is my fourth year here, my fourth different topic. Every year I get up here assuming that no one wants to hear me give my talk about anything that I'm doing, but I really believe in the things I'm doing. And I know that that belief, that passion, that drive comes out in my talk. And I know that that's what makes me good at presentations. But that also, that's also what attracts me to other people. If I'm sitting down having lunch at a table and you're just like, nah, I kind of did this thing. Like, you don't want to hear about it. It's dumb. Like, yeah, you're right. That sounds horrible. I don't hear about that. But if someone's like, you know, it's not really my job, but I've been working on this one really weird thing. Like the car hacking guys, there's Will that, use, that usually runs that. And uh, on Twitter, he's been talking about hacking into old telephone systems and elevators. So I saw him again. And he's like, oh, how are you? I was like, Will. What do you do in elevators? This is weird. I've seen it on Twitter. Oh, and he launched into the most beautiful speech about this like weird thing that he just does in his spare time. And for everyone wondering how you get hired, that's how you talk. I hire for aptitude, attitude, and willingness to learn. I will hire for that every time over top of an uh, amazing resume. Because that's what I want on my team. And anybody that, that hires, they know it too. Right? Yes, you have to have an aptitude for the things that we're doing. But we wouldn't be here if we didn't have some sort of aptitude towards technology or information security. And it doesn't have to be technical. So I used to tell people that I wasn't technical because I came from an Intel background. Um, but after like my third technical training, my boss has told me I wasn't allowed to tell people that anymore. Because I still don't see myself as technically focused because that wasn't my background. And there's so many people here that feel the same way. But you have an aptitude, otherwise you wouldn't be there. You wouldn't have applied. Your attitude, are you passionate? Do I believe you really do want to do this job? Do you have a willingness to learn? You know that unicorn job description? that no one can achieve because you have to both have a PhD and 25 years of experience, but it's an entry level job. Yeah, I know they exist. You just have to have a willingness to learn. I have a lead, which is like our highest level opening. And yet I've met with people that are new because I would degrade, like I would downgrade a position for somebody that shows me that they really want to work for me. 
they went above and beyond. Maybe it's not the current area of focus, but they went out and they studied and they found that they actually want to do this. So if you really want to do something in your career, take that leap of faith and apply for the job because if you can speak with passion about that topic, you, you're going to get those opportunities. I, my resume did not qualify me for any job that I applied for outside of the military. But when I was on a phone call with those interviewers, I spoke with passion about the idea of learning this new thing. Right? I had some background that could like kind of fit if like I wanted to really shove that like round peg into like a triangle hole because it wasn't even square. It wasn't like kind of going in, you know? But, but they took a chance on me because I wanted to do it. That's how you get people to take chances on you. Right? But training is also key to development. We all know this. It's a sore topic. I can't tell you how many times I have discussions about like, man, I really want to do this one thing, but my company will not pay for my training. It's like, that's true. But did you look into any of the free training out there? It exists. There's conferences that are free. You can always download the presentations afterwards. Every presentation given in the last two days will be online. You can still view them just because you didn't get to go there. And when you find somebody that you want to talk to and you're like, man, I don't have that opportunity to network with them face to face. Just remember, Twitter exists. Email exists. Everyone puts some way of contacting them on their slides because we're all super narcissistic and want to talk about the things that we already spent an hour talking about. Right? Just find your resource. When you figure out your community, figure out how they communicate. Right? I got into pen testing. I was used to Intel, working everything on the listservs. Found out people just put stuff in like weird GitHub lists out there. Like, okay, cool. Also, this is weird, but I guess this is how I live now. So um, I go out and I pull down these GitHub repositories where it's literally just lists linking back out to other things that shouldn't ever have been on GitHub in the first place. Twitter exists. I mean, Google it. Like, I feel like every time someone tells me that training is so hard, like, yes, it is hard. And yes, there are industry standard trainings out there. And yes, those certifications and those SANS courses, those do help you. But if you're really passionate about what you do, there are other ways to gain your knowledge. There are other ways that maybe you don't have the certification that the person going against the job interview with you has. But you know what? They're not going to speak as passionately about something that they just learned in a science course that you're going to be able to speak to because you spent two years pulling and scraping and finding all these amazing opportunities that you couldn't get for yourself at your company. It exists. And if you don't know where to find it, ask. Everybody in this community is more than willing to help. That's why we still call it a community. We rarely ever want to say that it's an infosec industry unless we're really trying to hire people and we're like, remember, we pay. You know? We call it a community because we want people to feel like they belong. We want people to feel like they could just ask and have it answered. But it's not just us, right? Sam, you're thinking like, oh, that'd be great. But you know who really needs to hear this? My CISO. And you know what? There are things that we, as people in charge, could be doing better too. We don't want to admit it, but like, honestly, we're just letting people flounder. And I realize I'm just a manager standing up here, probably talking to people that are way above my level and way above my layers of experience. But you know what? If I don't stand up here and tell you, this industry will never change. It won't feel like a community. We'll still have job turnovers. We'll still have anger and resentment. And it's so small. When I became a manager, I promised myself that I was going to do everything in my power to help those that I was in charge of. Because we need to change our mindsets, right? We need to stop thinking that I only care about you for the two to four years that you were on my team. This is a small community. And if I plan on being here for 20 years, I'm more than likely to run into those same people again. 
And five years from now, when they figured it out for themselves, and they realize that there are ways to get what they want, do I want them to look back and see me as somebody that helped them think about long-term career growth? Or just that boss that refused to let them go to training? It's small. Yes, it's growing. But we have to stop thinking about how do we get new people in and start taking care of the people we have. I was at a major conference last year, and on stage, it was a women's focused conference, but on stage there were women from all these top companies talking for an hour plus about all these amazing programs they're doing to bring more diverse talent into the industry. And yes, it was amazing, but I stood up and asked one question. You have amazing programs to bring people in from college. What programs do you guys offer to keep talent? How are you fixing your retention rates? And the answer I got was, that's HR's problem. No, that's your problem. It is. So many studies have shown that people are more than willing to stay in a job that provides less money as long as they're with a boss that they feel like cares about them and really wants to see them succeed. It has been proven. People are more than willing to kind of stay in that job frame as long as there's someone there that cares about them because it's so rare to find that. And I think it's even rare to find it within the InfoSec community. And it's sad because we have this mentality like I had to struggle to get to where I am. Why should I, you know, turn back and lend a hand to those people? They should struggle to get here too. That's what builds character. That's what gives people experience. No. That's why we have turnover rates. You helping somebody does not degrade your experience or the struggles that you went through. <laughs> Thank you, Molly. So how do you champion career growth, right? I'm at a company, they give me no money for training, they give me no time to set up any programs, I have nothing to offer my team. How, how can I possibly do this? Honestly, when your team members come to you and say like, hey, how am I doing? If your response to feedback or development is, you're doing great, keep doing what you're doing, that's offering them nothing. They may be a power performer for you. They may be everything that you want, but they wouldn't ask if they could be doing better if they needed guidance. So just provide it for them. Even if it's just, well, how do you feel it's going? Are you getting challenged? How do you feel your program's going? Where do you want to see it in the next year? What would you like to be doing? And I guarantee if you start that conversation, you're going to be surprised by what you get. Because if you haven't had those conversations, then you're missing. You're missing the person that's been looking at other job opportunities because they want to change and they feel like you're never going to give them the opportunity to grow. And yes, it might suck that they're not going to stay on your team, but wouldn't it be better to keep that power performer in your company, even if it's not on your team? We talked about changing from like IR to red team. If your IR team loves, your instant response team loves this employee, won't they add value to your red team? Why is it better to send them external than to keep them in the company? So what can you do, right? You can't force people to allow your team member, to allow your employee to train with them, but you know what you can do? You can open up your team. It starts with one. Target has a reputation for allowing like shadowing and cross training and stuff like that. But when I started, they, they didn't do it. It took years and one team to start. And what does shadowing look like? Two hours, letting someone sit with your team for two hours to learn what they want to do. I get asked all the time, internally, externally, like, hey, I think I want to do penetration testing. I'm like, cool. Have you ever seen a penetration test? Have you sat with a team that's actually doing it? Are you sure this is what you want to do? Because yes, being a hacker is cool, but like compliance is a real thing and you're not hacking into NSA. You're looking at a web application for the 10th year in a row because we have to check a box for SOX compliance. Like these things are equal. And well, yes, you do have amazing opportunities, but when 70% of your time is spent doing the same things over and over and over again, I want to make sure that you're passionate about this job. So come sit with my team. 
Maybe you can only give up two hours of your time, but if you're willing to give up two hours for me, my team's willing to teach you. That's how you have to structure your team. If someone is willing to give up their time to learn from you, be willing to teach them. Cross training is a thing too, right? Not everyone gets to do it, but if you have someone that's actually passionate, let them sit with them for a month. Let them cross train internally. Let them have that chance at that internal job. We shouldn't have to constantly send people externally. It doesn't mean they're going to leave. You know that weird job that I had that was like IR and detection and Intel? I was doing phishing analysis for my company and I noticed that every time I had an external information come in, I would do all of this analysis on it. I would hand it off to our IR team. And because I didn't always know the analysts, they would be duplicating work. And when I'd get the case back to look at it, some of it was not there. So I said, you know what? I'm going to sit with IR for a month. And I got trained on using our system. So now when that month was over, I went back to my team and I got the external intel. And I did all the research and I worked the case and closed the case. I did all of our response work and then I worked with detection and I wrote the detection. Because if I'm going to do all the work, I want to make sure that I was able to see the whole process. And the entirety of the management that allowed me to do that had to take a, fa a leap of faith that I wasn't like just doing it to leave a day later. And even if the person that you give the opportunity to does leave, it should make you feel good to know that you help them on the journey that's going to give them long-term career success. If that success isn't with you, it's okay. We have to stop looking at it as a failure. Retention issues are always going to be here. Thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands of openings, and that number is growing. We can't fill them all, but you know what you can do? Make it memorable that you were the person that helped them on their career path. Mentoring, right? These are things that you should do in your company, but everyone thinks it's just a manager and a contributor. Set people up for development. If the person that you're talking to needs help with communication skills, think about the people that you know that communicate well and set them up there. It doesn't matter what the levels are. Start setting your mentoring priorities up for your development. And if you are one of those people that have to be a mentor, pick your mentee before it gets assigned to you. These are easy, right? If you are here and you're a lead or you're at the top of your game or you're a subject matter expert, you're going to be a mentor. That's how, that's how companies see you. So you pick your mentee and it's really easy. I'm gonna give you guys a secret. You ready? Find somebody you would trust with your project because the whole reason why you need a mentee is so that you can move on. If you created a process, a project, a program, and it's running beautifully at your company, your company wants you to do that again. But you can't if you're constantly worried about holding on so tightly to that thing because you don't know who you're going to trust with it. Find the person to trust yourself. Find them. Find that person that speaks to you with passion, aptitude, attitude, willingness to learn. Same thing. If you want them on your team... Trust them with your projects. So we're almost done here. For yourself, soft skills, networking, training, tell me something cool. If you come up to me today and you don't start by telling me something cool that you're working on, come on now. For others, if you're in charge of teams, if you're in charge of people, mentoring, shadowing, cross-training, these things exist even if you can't provide them personally, find them opportunities. I have only been a manager of penetration testing for a year, and I don't have a background in penetration testing, but I still have to have these conversations on a regular basis. And what I do is I will go out and I'll do the research, or I'll talk to someone else on my team that has a lot more experience, and I say, what did you do to get where you are? What can I help them with? Or I set them up with it, and I say, you know what, I can't help you, but you know who on our team was just telling me something cool that they were doing in the same area? Why don't, you, why don't we, you know, get together and ask them? Because you don't need to be the next anybody in information security, right? We don't need another Jason Street, Dave Kennedy, Chris Roberts. We don't need another me. Yes, I want all of you guys to succeed, and I want you all to get to where I am. 
but you don't need to check a box and follow my path to get here. I don't want you to be the next anybody in information security because I want you to be the first you. I don't want to be like, I saw this person talking on stage about this amazing opportunity and now, you know, everybody in the industry knows about them. Because you're all unicorns and we should be embracing that. Because it's not bad that your background has 20 different things. It's what makes our whole community unique and weird and definitely inappropriate at times and the reason why we all are here. So if nothing else, I hope you guys all go through the rest of your day thinking that you're a unicorn.